Okay, I'm going to do an example of computing a confidence interval for a mean via a t-distribution. And the subject matter of this example is going to be quite familiar, at least to me. Um, whenever you measure your tire pressure in a car, it turns out that the gauges that you use can actually be quite different, and the readings that they give can be quite different. So it really puts you... Uh, at a, at a loss for what the tire pressure actually is. Because if you use one gauge, maybe it's 33, another gauge is 35. So what I've done here is I've said, well, we made five measurements of tire pressure, 31, 29, 31, 30, and 33, and we're going to get a 95% confidence interval for that tire pressure based on those five measurements. We're going to assume that the readings of, a, um, of the tire pressure are normally distributed and independent and identically distributed to get this confidence interval. Okay, so first thing we're going to do is compute x-bar. And x-bar, remember, is a sample mean. So x-bar is a 31 plus a 29 plus 31 plus 30 plus 33. And then we divide by 5. Okay, and that comes out to 30.8 let you do that calculation on your own. Okay, and then again we're doing a 95% confidence interval. So we're going to have a curve here. Whoops, I, my right side was a little bit different looking than my left side. Let's see, I'll try one more time and then I'll give up. There we go, that was much better. Okay, here is my mean and that's what I'm wanting to measure. That's it. Um, it's actually going to be t equal to zero, and we'll talk about why it's t instead of um, z. And I'll have values here, and that is, I'll say this is the absolute value of t sub 30.8, and this is the um, opposite of that absolute value of t of 30.8. Where the t value is the sample mean minus the actual mean mu divided by s over the square root of 5. So we'll go find s via the usual method, but the reason that we use a t value instead of a z score, so we use t instead, or you could call this a t score, whoops, I need an a there, Z because we want to recognize possible error in the estimation of sigma. Okay. When you think of the sample mean as a random variable, then it's normally distributed with mean mu and standard deviation sigma over the square root of n, where sigma is the standard deviation of the tire pressure measure, of the measurement of the tire pressure. Okay. However, a lot of the times, we don't actually know what the standard deviation is. Instead, we have to estimate it. If we have a small sample size, and the standard is, um, if it's less than 30, then we really should take into account possible variation that could occur because of this estimate of the standard deviation. I just have five data values here. I just have five data values here. So it's pretty likely that my estimate for standard deviation is going to be off by a fair amount. Okay. The t distribution takes that into account, and it's it's more spread out than the normal distribution is. It looks like a, nor a bell curve, but it's not. It's like a bell curve, except for it takes into account the estimation of the standard deviation. So s here, let's see, is one over n minus one, since we have four of them. Um, or excuse me, we have five measurements. That'll be four times the sum of the xi minus the sample mean squared. Okay, so what do we get there? Let's see, I'll use my, scroll up and use my calculator so I can see these mess estimates. Whoops, excuse me, that was s squared. That wasn't s. So if I want s, I take the square root of that. 
Okay, let's pull up the calculator here. All right. And I want one fourth, I'll write that as 0.25 times. Okay, well, first of all, we have 31 minus the mean of 30.8, and we're going to square that. Okay. Plus 29 minus 30.8, and we're going to square that. Plus, see, we have 31 again, minus 30.8. We'll square that. Plus, just got a couple more, 30 minus 30.8 squared plus, um, let's see, 33 minus 30.8 squared. Okay, so this will be the variance, and then if we take the square root of that, so let's see, where's square root? There it is. I knew there was a button for it somewhere. Um, we get about 1.4832. Okay, so let's put that on here. On our whiteboard, we have the S is about 1.483. So that is our estimate for the standard deviation of one measurement. Okay, that was the estimate for the standard deviation of X. And then to get the standard deviation of the um, sample mean, we take that and we divide by the square root of 5. Okay, so our T-score is going to be the sample mean that we observed minus the actual mean divided by about 1.483 divided by the square root of 5, or the square root of 2.2 would be exact. Okay, now again, we're doing a 95% confidence interval. So that means we want to include all the values for mu for which the probability that the sample means no more extreme than what we saw is less than or equal to 0.95. So we want this area to be 0.95. Okay, now this works a lot like doing the normal distribution, but not exactly. We also need to know degrees of freedom. And the degrees of freedom is one less than the sample size. So in this case it's four, and we'll need to use that on the table. So we have a 95% confidence level and four degrees of free freedom. Okay, so if I pull up my t-table here, okay, there's a lot going on here. First of all, at the bottom they have the confidence level, so we're doing 95%, so we want to be in this column. All right, and our degrees of freedom is over here. We have four. So let's see, that is right here. 2.766. What that is, is the number of S's, the number of estimated standard deviations. Or for this case, we're doing the sample mean, so it's the number of estimated standard deviations divided by the square root of five, that we need to be away from the middle in order to have that area be 0.95. Okay, so this, if that area is really exactly 0.95, then this t-score would come out to be 2.776. Okay, and this t-score, or this value would come out to be negative 2.776. So the t-value of our um, sample mean that we observed needs to be less than that, at least in absolute value. So the absolute value of 30.8 minus mu divided by 1.483 divided by the square root of 5 needs to be less than or equal to 2.776. If this, if we were using a normal distribution table, this would have been 1.96. So notice we're really going to have a much larger interval. And the reason for that much larger interval is that we're accounting for the estimate and standard deviation. That's an extra level of randomness that's thrown in there. Okay, so Let's see, um, if I, I'll go ahead and multiply by this denominator and split it up into two 
inequalities. So we'll have negative 2.776 times 1.483 divided by the square root of 5. That is less than or equal to 30.8 minus mu, which is less than or equal to 2.776 times 1.483. What we're going to do is we're going to solve for mu here. Okay, So I'll subtract the 30.8 and then I'll change the sign of everything and that will give me 30.8 plus 2.776 times 1.483 divided by the square root of 5. Okay, Again, since I changed signs I need to flip that inequality. And then over here, let's see, the 30.8 comes over and it's negative, but then the sign gets changed so it's positive. And this is already positive, so when we change the sign, it's negative, and we get minus 2.776 times 1.483 over the square root of 5. Okay, and if we plug that in the calculator, let's see, I have 30.8 plus 2.776 times 1.483 divided by the square root of 5. Okay, That gives us about 2... Wait, something's a little off here. Oh, there we go, there we go. I just had to hit equals again. <laughs> I knew that this didn't have a magnitude that was anywhere close to 30, so it was going to have to be close to 30. Um, Point eight there. So that was 32.64 approximately. 32.64 less than or equal to mu, less than or equal to, we're going to do the same thing except for we put a minus sign in there. And again, I don't know of how to get um, this Windows calculator to be able to bring up what I previously entered. There might be a way, I'm not for sure. That would be a good thing to Google search. Okay, the lower bound is 28.96. Okay, so there's our confidence interval. About 28.96 to 32.64. So I can be 95% confident that my um, that the tire pressure is actually within that range, assuming that the normal distribution on which the measurements are, occur is actually centered at the actual value. So the, the mean value for the measurements, if we assume that's equal to the actual tire pressure, then this is a 95% confidence interval for that tire pressure. Now remember, this does not mean that there's a 95% chance that the tire pressure is in that interval. That's getting at the right idea, but it's not conceptually accurate because the tire pressure is a value. It's either in that interval or not. It's not a probabilistic statement. We don't know if it's in that interval or not, and that's why it's called a confidence interval. But whether or not the interval is in that, or the value is in that interval or not, we, is not probabilistic. So instead, what this is saying is the method that we used produces an interval that contains the actual tire pressure 95% of the time. So we can be 95% confident that the actual tire pressure is in here. Okay, so that's it for confidence intervals, and in the last phase of the course, we're going to go on to hypothesis testing. And um, what we're going to learn in hypothesis testing is how researchers, at least in one particular case, measure whether a result is statistically significant or not. Unfortunately, we're going to, not going to have time in this course to go into a lot of other interesting areas of statistics, such as multiple regression or analysis of variance, but really the methods behind those techniques are not much different different than what, we've, what we're doing in this section of the course. I'm trying to give you a few topics, a few basic topics of statistics, and really talk about them in detail, why they work. And then if you do need to use or teach some of the other topics, I don't think it'll be that hard because really the reasoning behind them is not much different than what we're doing here. So anyway, I will see you in the next video when we go on to hypothesis testing.